Welcome to the Prison Professors Podcast. We serve people who face challenges with prosecution, sentencing, and prison. My co-founders are Sean Hopwood and Justin Paperni. My name is Michael Santos. We create digital content and our team offers individual consulting services. We also assist agencies that want to improve outcomes. To learn how we can help you, text the word Prison Pro to 44222. Again, text Prison Pro to 44222 and get our free brochure. You can also visit us at prisonprofessors.com or contact Justin at 818 424 2220. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Send confirmation that you reviewed our podcast and we'll send you a free digital book. Stay tuned for a 20 to 30 minute episode of Prison Professors. I am Michael Santos with Prison Professors, and today I have the privilege of introducing you to Michael Gonzalez. Michael, say hello to our audience. How are you guys doing today? I, I'm, I'm glad that you're with us, Michael, because you're going to give us the opportunity to do kind of a live uh, Q&A about how somebody prepares for sentencing. You gave us, let, let our audience know why you and I are talking, how this began. Uh, basically, unfortunately, I live in a medical marijuana state and I had a run in with the police. And when they came to my property, I was over the plan count that you're allowed in medical marijuana. And I started, uh, after I accepted my plea deal, I started looking around pre-sentence review and I found your website and noticed the different instructions you had in videos like that. So I contacted you to kind of get a background on what I should do. When you looked at the site, I have a number of different websites and my partners have a number of different websites on the internet. Did you find prisonprofessors.com? Is that the yes. one you found? Yes, I did, Michael. Excellent. So I, I would really encourage you to look through all of the free resources that are available on there because they will really help you understand a lot more about this process. And more importantly, they will help you understand steps that you can take to begin preparing for a life for the best possible outcome. Now you said that you're facing some charges. Tell us a little bit about the details of those charges that you're facing. Uh, well, I actually already took my plea deal, but the charges I was facing was 117 marijuana plants, which would be 20 to 200 delivery and manufacturing and a Xanax charge. For and four what years. is the length? You said that you took a plea deal. What is the exposure to prison time that you're facing? Uh, they charged, I pled to maintaining a drug house and attempt to maintain a drug house. The maintaining a drug house is two years and the attempt is one year. And Max. you're, you're hoping for what's the best possible outcome? Uh, right now, according to prosecutors and kind of some evidence I've done background wise is about 90 to 180 days in jail and then 18 to 24 months probation. And you contacted me because you wanted some help in seeing what steps you could take to put you in the best possible position. Is that right? Yes, I did. Could you tell us a little bit about how your attorney has prepared you for that eventual or to put you in that category that you can get the best possible outcome? Uh, he has not at all. Basically, uh, I've done my own research and looked up everything and kind of been trying to prepare myself. And what have you found? Uh, I found that the preliminary examination is basically the only thing the judge is going to get to know about you. And it's basically a big deal because it's the way he's going to portray you and think of you as a person and think of how hard your sentencing should be. Right now, the only thing the judge knows about you is what the prosecutor and the investigators of the crime have presented. Is that your, is that your understanding? Yes, sir. So it's our job to work together and figure out what steps can we take to kind of disrupt that mindset of the judge. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would, Michael. So that's exactly what we're going to do through this process. Now, ordinarily, when people reach out and, and ask for this type of guidance, I always say we give away more content than we sell. And the reason that we give that content away is that we understand very uh, few people can afford to retain somebody to work exclusively for them for a period of 20 or 25 hours because although you know the history of your life, I don't know anything about you and that's what we have to try and do together is figure out a pathway to help that judge see you as a human being. Are you, are you married, Mike? Yes. So we, And you've got a good relationship with your wife? Yes. So it would be a fair to say that your wife sees you 
somewhat differently from the way the prosecutors are going to present you. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. Okay. And why is it that your wife sees you differently? Tell us that. Um, I got with her when her daughter was about three years old and I raised her daughter as my own. Uh, so she's always been very thankful for in that sense. And I've provided for her and tried to keep us in the best of health and as financially responsible as possible. And does your wife know about your background, your childhood? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Does she know your parents? No, unfortunately, my grandfather, which is my father figure, uh, died nine years ago. How about your mom and dad? Uh, my mother was a pathological liar, and I haven't seen her since I'm about nine years old. She dropped me off on my grandfather's doorstep and never looked back. And your father? My father, unfortunately, went to Vietnam, is bipolar, and has dementia also. And due to his uh, bipolarness, spent a lot of time in and out of mental institutions and was not able to be there for me. And what would you say those influences have had on your development as a human being? Um, I'm a little less social than most people are. Um, I'm more of a loner. Uh, it's caused me to be more grateful for the people that do care about me and that are in my life. And it's taught me that mental illness can affect the way you think and the way you are. And how about growing up? What kind of influences did you have as a young boy? Um, basically, my grandfather and my grandmother working two jobs to put food on the table and trying to do the possible best they could to take care of me and to take care of themselves. What did your grandfather do to earn a living? He was uh, like manufacturing. Basically, he did like warehouse jobs, like those little to build little um, instruments uh, for your heart and things like that. And what kind of living did he earn? Was he, what, what kind of uh, stability did he provide for his family? Uh, he actually bought a home uh, in 1964. Back then, the house was about $20,000. And uh, he worked two jobs, and my grandmother worked two jobs to be able to keep that house and to be able to keep food on the table. So they made minimum wage, but they made it work. What kind of educational background did they have? Uh, nothing. They came here from Cuba when they were already about 30 and 40 years old. Ha! Coño! <laughs> yes, <laughs> My <sir>. father's <laughs> from Cuba. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do you speak Spanish? Sí, hablo español. Oh, I don't speak very good in Spanish, oh, yeah, I, Spanish I, I very well. I just know how to say coño. <laughs> 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 okay. so, so anyway, uh, your, so your family came without much of an education. What level of influence did they place on education while you were growing up? Uh, they placed a lot of uh, influence on it. They wanted me to try the best to go to college. Unfortunately, we didn't have the financial um, availability of being able to do that. And I started working at a very young age. I started working at 16 years old to be able to help put food on the table and to be able to help my grandparents out. So how far did you go in school? Um, I went for my associates. I basically did about a year in college. And then from there, back up a little bit. Tell us about your early school. What about your elementary school? Where did you go to elementary school? Um, when I was a young boy, basically before 10 years old, uh, I would go to five different schools in one year because my mother, my mother was very unstable. Uh, so my early elementary days was not very stable. Uh, basically at the age of 10, I had a very traumatic situation happen, which I wouldn't like to disclose, which my mother uh, then felt that she couldn't deal with me anymore. She wouldn't be able to be there for me. So she showed up to my grandparents' door and told them that she wanted to drop me off for a little bit. My grandfather responded that he was not going to be in a game and back and forth. So he wanted full custody and he wanted her to put that in writing so that they would be able to raise me. Okay. And then how did that influence your junior high school years and then your high school years? Uh, junior high, I got picked on a lot. Uh, I wasn't very confident uh, due to just a lot of my growing up with my father and my mother and issues like that. So I got picked on a lot. Uh, I got good grades and was kind of a nerd. And then in high school, I kind of went through a rebellious stage. Uh, 
kind of wanted to try to fit in, kind of wanted to be a cool kid. And uh, it really didn't come out to be a good thing. And then I got my head on straight when I started working and I started noticing what it was to work as a bag boy and make $7 an hour. So I tried to improve after that point. And how old were you when you got that first job? I was 16 years old, sir. And you work, quit calling me, sir. <laughs> and so, have it, man. and so you worked and so you worked at, while you were going through high school. Does that mean that you didn't have any opportunities or did you have opportunities to participate in sports or anything like that? Uh, I played football uh, when I was 14 and 15, but turning into 16, uh, I was mainly about just trying to make money and trying to help out. My grandfather, unfortunately, when I was 16, um, he got very sick and he couldn't work anymore. So they retired him early and uh, I tried to make up for that as much as possible. And what city did you grow up in? Miami, Florida. So Miami is, has a reputation for being a, uh, a drug hotspot. Did you, did you get influenced in any way by seeing drugs around your school or around your community when you were growing up? Uh, I think it influenced me a lot. Um, it, it opened my mind to, I guess, different things than what I've allowed my kids to see. And uh, I've raised them in different neighborhoods and tried to move them out of the areas where I grew up in and grow them in less of a poorer area so that maybe they didn't get those same influences I did. So you, so you are saying that the drugs did have somewhat of an influence on you. You saw other people who were using drugs and selling drugs. Is that right? That was part of your normal experience growing up? Yes, sir. Yes. And, and what aspirations did you have when you were in school? What did you see yourself doing when you grew up? Uh, honestly, I wanted to become a lawyer or a veterinarian. Uh, those were really my two things. Um, growing up, but unfortunately, you know, to get a law degree costs uh, a lot of money. It costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of commitment and it takes a lot of mentoring that doesn't sound like it was a big part of your childhood. What did you do after high school? You said that you, I think I heard you say you went to community college. Oh uh, yes, I went to community college and I basically worked, uh, when I found out my son was born, I worked two jobs. Uh, I was, I basically worked warehousing my whole life. Uh, until about the age of 26, where I found a job uh, for a warehouse that would sell cameras and things like that to Latin America. And that's where I started learning how to install CCTVs and do things like that. Okay. And at some point you got involved in black market activities, selling drugs or something a lot, or being involved with people who are selling drugs. When did that start? Well, it really isn't a black market because here you're allowed to be a caregiver and you're growing for your patients. Uh, unfortunately, I had a lot of small two foot tall uh, trees. I was trying to pheno hunt, which is a thing in marijuana, which is you're trying to find a certain strand. Uh, my mother-in-law got diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. Uh, so basically, <clears throat> upon that time, uh, I was growing for medical reasons, not really for an illegal black market type of thing. I see. And, and what was the result of you becoming targeted from, by the criminal justice system? How did that, how did that investigation begin? Um, to explain the whole thing, I had leased out my property to somebody um, because my mother-in-law was diagnosed with cancer and I had to come back to Miami to be with her and to take care of her. Um, the agreement with that person was for them to build the property and prepare the property for marijuana to be grown. Um, while he was there at the property, I needed an electric, so an electrical inspection done to raise the light. So I had flown out to Michigan to be ready for that. And those electrical, the electrical inspector informed the police officers that they thought I was asking for too much power and kind of sent them out to the property. Okay. So, I th and when did this happen? Uh, this happened June, four, June 6th of 2017. And what has been going on since June of 17 in the process? What's, go what's happened since then? Um, basically, I've been living at the home, going to court, uh, working for my small business and trying to, I'm also ADHD. And it makes things a lot harder. Marijuana helps me with my ADHD. Um, 
when I was 21, I got into a back injury at work. I got, I had two herniated discs. I started smoking marijuana to help alleviate the pain. And I actually figured out that it worked a lot better than Ritalin and things like that. Ritalin would make me feel like a zombie. So I started to use the medication to help me with my ADHD, with my nervousness, with my not being able to sleep and th- and things like that. Are you still using it? Uh, no, because it's against my bond. So, um, and I've started this week, I'm going to AA meetings because I'm not able to sleep and it's making this whole situation a lot harder because an ADHD person, you just keep thinking on the same thing and the same thing and the same thing and you just can't let something go. So imagine when your life's on the line, uh, it's kind of brain racking. What do you know about your sentencing judge? Um, he's very strict. Uh, he's very known. The prosecutor has let my attorney know that he would most likely send me to jail that he's very known for even first time offendants like myself, uh, sending them to prison for at least 90 to 180 days. Okay. So I'm going to now, I've got a, I only had 15 minutes of interviewing you, right? But in those 15 minutes, I got a lot of information. You've given me a lot of information and I'm going, although I didn't take any notes, I'm going to kind of tell you what I heard and tell you what thoughts I have with regard to you putting together your own mitigation strategy. Okay. Does that sound okay? Yes. And you'll be able to use this video kind of as a guide to help you get ready for this very important sale that you're about to make. And this is going to be the most important sale that you've ever had to make in your life because you're effectively arguing for your liberty. And that's very valuable to you, okay? So we should begin by understanding what is the purpose of the sentence, okay? Don't have to write anything down. You're going to have this video. But I'm going to read to you some of the, some of the guidelines that a judge is supposed to consider when he is going to sentence an individual. And one, it says here, I'm, gonna, I'm looking over at a different screen on my computer right now, so if I'm looking away, that's why. But it says that the court shall impose a sentence that is sufficient but not greater than necessary to comply with the purposes set forth in paragraph two of the subsection. I'm going to read that. Now, in determining the sentence, what the judge should consider is the nature and the circumstances of the offense and the history of the characteristics of the defendant. So right now, the judge has no knowledge of your history. All the judge knows is what the investigators and the prosecutors have put forward. That's all the judge knows, okay? So it's our job to help that judge know about the what led you here, and we're gonna talk about that. Number two, it's gonna say, that the judge is supposed to consider a sentence that will reflect the seriousness of the offense so that he can promote respect for the law and provide just punishment for the offense. That's one factor. Two, he is supposed to afford adequate deterrence for criminal conduct. Deterrence means he wants to make sure that somebody else is deterred from doing the type of things that you did. So the sentence has to reflect that. That's the judge's responsibility. Three, the judge has to issue a sentence that is going to protect the public from further crimes that you could commit. Okay? That's a third component. They said that you've committed a crime, the judge should protect the public from you. Let's understand that. And then... He should provide the defendant with needed educational and vocational training, medical care, or other treatment in the most effective manner possible. So those are the factors that the judge should consider when imposing the sentence, okay? Okay. Our job is to show why it's in the interest of justice and why it's in the interest of fairness that the judge spares you from going to prison. Isn't that our ultimate goal? Yes, it is. (laughs) Okay. If that's our ultimate goal, we have to stop thinking about ourselves from our perspective 
and really think about this law and order judge who likes to put people in prison, okay? Most of the time when he is putting somebody in prison, those people aren't really going through the effort that you're about to go through, which is really help him understand your history, what you've learned from this process, who the victims are of this crime. Do you know who the victims of this crime are? The police officer said that they're the victims because they had to cut everything down and waste their time and go through this whole process. And, and do you see them as a victim? Honestly. I would, I would not agree with that. <laughs> okay, that's enough. We don't want to say any more than that because I'm, I'm writing this record, but I want to help you understand that is a very important question for you to answer because I want you to think not from your perspective, but from the perspective of this law and order judge. You see, most defendants would say exactly what you just said, but we are going to try a different approach, okay? Okay. We are going to try an approach that's different from most people who go through the criminal justice system. Everybody who goes through the criminal justice system wants the same outcome that you are describing. Everybody wants to avoid prison, okay? I but not everybody wants to prepare the best possible approach to get them ready for avoiding prison or to at least advance the possibility. Most people just wait for their defense attorneys to make the case. But the real person that can move the needle, Michael, is you. You are the most important person in this entire equation. And here I am going to now kind of recite something that I kind of heard you telling me. And I want you, when you're writing your own mitigation piece, you to think this through. Now, the sweet spot in writing this is going to be between five and eight single-spaced pages, okay? It can't be a page and a half because, you know, that doesn't really show a deep level of understanding and, and introspection, but it also can't be 25 pages because the judge isn't going to take the time to read all of that. Okay, so you've got to think, what's the sweet spot? And I would say that's going to be between five and eight pages. Start from that premise. And during those five and eight pages, we want to accomplish a couple of things. One, we want to definitely show that we identify with the victims of this crime. Very important to the judge. Might not be so important to you and the people you love, but we don't need to convince them. They already know you're a good guy. We need to convince a judge. Number two, we need to think about how much we've learned through this process. Number three, we have got to help that judge understand the influences that led you into this situation. But we also have to show what we've learned so the judge can be sure that you are never again going to come before a criminal court of law. And then we have to show what steps you are taking to make things right. And if we can do that, we really advance the possibility of getting a better sentence. So I'm going to just try and narrate something for you. And you're going to take it and expand upon it after you listen to this video over and over and over again. Okay? Okay. okay. What's your judge's name? That's all right. I'm going to call him Judge Stevens, okay? So you start off, Dear Judge Stevens, I'm writing this letter to express my deep remorse for the very bad decisions that I have made. Nobody is to blame but me. I should have known better than to have broken the law, and I should have known that my bad decisions were going to hurt the community of which I very much want to be a part. Although there's nothing that I can say that will excuse my bad decisions, what I would like to do, Your Honor, is help you understand a little bit more about how I got here. And it's my hope that if you understand some of the influences of my life, you will look at me as being a human being who is flawed and who has some challenges, but is always striving to become a better citizen. 
And that's what I want to do, is to become a better citizen. And by revealing this story, Your Honor, it's my hope that you will find it in your heart to have mercy on me as you deliberate over the appropriate sentence. Start off with something like that, okay? You completely say, it's my fault. Nobody's to blame but me. And because of my decisions, some people suffered. And we're going to elaborate on that. But first, we're going to tell them how we got here. So then you might start off with a background that says, let me tell you about who I am and how I got here. And then you might say, I was born into a very difficult life. My father was a, a veteran of the armed forces and he struggled through Vietnam. And when he returned, he had some significant mental health problems. I didn't have a very close relationship with him. In fact, he was sick for my entire life, and I always missed growing up with a good father figure in my life. My mother also was challenged with some mental health problems. We were unstable. I was born on, what's your birthday? December 16, 1984. I was born on December 16, 1984, and that makes me, what, 35 years? How old are you? 34. That makes me 34 years old right now. And I can tell you, Your Honor, it has been a life of struggle for as long as I can remember. My mother tried to raise me in one community that was very poor, and we never had a steady flow of food. I never knew whether we were going to be homeless or whether we were going to move from one location to another. And it was very traumatizing for me as a young boy. And I don't have any doubt that those influences played a role in the decisions I made as I grew older. By the time I was 10, I underwent some serious psychological challenges, which I would like to explain to you because they had a big impact on my life. And then you reveal whatever it is you didn't want to reveal on camera, you put that in the thing because that's important. Then you say, after those challenges, my mother elected, my mother realized that she didn't have the resources or the stability to provide me with the level of guidance that I would need while growing up. And so she relinquished her parental rights and gave me over to my grandfather. And although I loved my grandparents very much, it was a challenge for them. Both my grandparents worked at minimum wage jobs. They immigrated to the United States from Cuba, just wanting to build a better life. But since they didn't have much money, they were always working, and I really felt as if I was growing up parenting myself. And that led to some challenges that I had when I was in junior high school and high school. I wasn't the best of students. I wanted, I had dreams of becoming a lawyer or a veterinarian or some type of profession but I just didn't have the, the strength of character to find ways that would help me advance my studies and stay in school. When I was 16, my grandparents became sick. They lost their employment. I wanted to help them. And so I started working as a bag boy at a local grocery store. And that furthered me away from my studies even worse. But I was trying to develop a work ethic and trying to contribute. Your Honor, I know that I stand before you charged and pleading guilty to criminal charges, but I hope that you will see that all through my life there has been a pattern of hard work and trying to help other people. I tried to help my mother, I tried to help my grandfather, and I tried to be a good citizen. After high school, I found my way into a vocational program so that I could learn how to work in the uh, electronics industry with televisions and cable TVs and just trying to earn a living. But then tragedy struck our family again when my mother-in-law was contracted with cancer. And I wanted to help her. And by trying to help her, I kind of lost sight of the importance of living as a good law-abiding citizen. Instead of thinking about the laws that were legislators passed to protect our community, 
I just chose to focus on helping my grandmother and I did that by engaging in this business relationship that would result in growing marijuana that I could provide to my family. I also suffered from some mental health challenges. I have been diagnosed with ADHD and it's influenced my life and I found that marijuana could help me through this process. But since then, Your Honor, I've learned a great deal. And then we go on and we talk about what we learned. We've got to talk about how after you were charged, you recognize that you were on a bad path. And I, I did everything possible, Your Honor, to try and, and make amends and accept responsibility and begin turning a page toward a better life. I have complied with all of the requirements that my probation officer has placed upon me during this pretrial stage. I have even stopped voluntarily using marijuana because I didn't want to cause any more problems. I didn't want to do anything that would be in violation of the law ever again. You see, Your Honor, one thing I have learned is that what unites us all as human beings is that we all have to be part of something that's bigger than ourselves. And I know this community is far more important than my own decisions. I want to live as a law-abiding citizen. I am hopeful that at some point in time, the world will see me as somebody who is responding responsibly to a bad decision that I made during the worst time of my life when I saw a loved one struggling with health concerns. And you see, if you do all of that, what we're trying to do, Michael, is satisfy these components that the judge has to consider. We're helping him see that you didn't do this for some selfish reasons, but rather you wanted to help somebody else and you have a long history of that. We're also showing that you faced a lot of challenges throughout your life. We're showing that you've really introspected and thought about what got you here. And we are hoping that we are getting him to see you as a human being and not only for what the prosecutors are alleging. Can you follow that? Yeah, I can follow that. That's what I want you to do in this letter, okay? For you to do that letter, you're the one who knows all about your life. I interviewed you for 15 minutes and just whipped that together. To do a, a, a full process would take me several hours of interviewing, a lot of detailed note-taking, because in this strategy, what's really important are the details. You've got to be telling him where did you work? What did you learn? What did you aspire to become? And all of those efforts together are what's going to help him see this defendant is different. And although this judge may say, I want to put everybody in prison, this defendant is telling me at least is making the most plausible case that he identifies with the victims, that he understands the seriousness of this offense, that he understands that laws are to protect the community and he has a duty to abide by those laws and that he wants to make things right. And he's doing things to make things better by voluntarily abstaining from substance abuse. That's what you want to do, Michael. And if you can do that in five to eight pages, I think you really advance the case for your sentencing hearing. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll take all your advice and uh, I'll try to lead off from there. Good, Thank you good. So much, Michael. All right. Well, I'm going to um, I'm going to close this because we've come to the end of this episode right now. But I want to wish you success on this process and call us back after you finish so that we can do a follow up and learn a little bit about how your sentencing proceedings went. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Mike. You have a great one. Stand by for, uh, let me just close out the show. I am Michael with Prison Professors. We hope that you are learning something from our program, that you will subscribe to us on YouTube or listen, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. And if you'd like some information on how we can help you, please text 44222 to, uh, and text the word Prison Pro to 44222 and you'll get a brochure that describes all the different ways that we help individuals. And uh, hopefully you'll find a lot of information on our website at prisonprofessors.com that you can use to help yourself. I am Michael with Prison Professors and we'll be back tomorrow with another inspiring guest. Thank you.